Last episode on marketing, we ended up with the question of what does it mean to be authentic? What is it to be an authentic, <laughs> an authentic brand? Chris and, and Marie just drove right over the edge and just <laughs> went straight for it. And I think that it's a really hard philosophical question about being authentic and what does it mean to be authentic and live authentically? But also I think that is a modern view of marketing to say that we, the marketer wants to produce an authentic connection to a person based on their values. But in some ways that goes completely against philosophical concepts of authenticity, which actually in some ways say that things like advertising or societal pressures are avoided by the authentic person. So today we're going to get into that whole fucking mess. Let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Or Jake, roll the tape. So I think that even opens a bigger question, right? Which is, can you even ever truly be authentic? Like, can an individual ever be their authentic self. Isn't there always some type of constraint or some type of filter or some type of something that's that's that is controlling that or changing that? Well, and even if you were being your authentic self, how would the person who is observing you truly ever know that you're authentic or not? There uh, you go. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's it. Fuck. Take that. Sart kicked in the Episode nads. Episode over. Take that. So yeah. Kicked in the <laughs> nads, Sart and Nietzsche. The, okay. <laughs> the. But really, seriously. Well, okay. And isn't authenticity really just its own marketing? Like, how hard would it be to constantly be authentic? It would be exhausting and it would be impossible. Well, okay. So there's different. There are different. First off, you know, a truly authentic person knows that. Any Let me tell you about my mother. No, I'm just joking. A, a truly authentic person, based on all these philosophies, yeah. would know that um, the authentic person doesn't give a crap what some old dead French guy has to say about being authentic. So it doesn't even matter. True. But okay. Well, no. True. But let's let's get into the kind of general conception here. So yeah. Historically, the idea of authenticity meant essentially like know thyself. Right. So kind of this from this concept of like the Oracle of Delphi said that, and you know, it's what. Socrates and Plato and then Aristotle would say and mm -hmm. uh, all these Seems other like kind of good ideas sound counsel mm -hmm. the and it has a relationship to another idea which is called kind of acting in bad faith or acting inauthentically so acting in a way which is acting in a way which is sort of hiding your true motivations your true feelings or, or other things mm -hmm. an idea about it it's really a very challenging question because a lot of philosophers will come out and say, so for example, this was the main, this was one of the main things the existentialists were interested in. And now existential philosophy is its whole own subset of, and this whole own crazy history and everything else. And none of them liked being called existentialists really. But so the people who we often kind of lump into the idea of existentialism are, you know, Soren Kierkegaard, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, Nietzsche, of course, uh, Heidegger, um, Adorno and, and Horkheimer to some extent, but like not really, but kind of sort of they had things to say about they had things to say about existentialism, but kind of not necessarily so much um, in the way that we think of it. But so there are a lot of there are a lot of these sort of ideas that come about this and a lot of existentialism sort of develops as an offshoot or not only an offshoot, but it really affects. It really affects Marxist thought and sort of the Frankfurt school style of philosophy that comes from Hegel or kind of grows out of Hegelian philosophy. All of that means completely fucking nothing to anyone who hasn't done a philosophy deep dive or whatever. But essentially the idea is this, all of this stems from this idea that your time and attention is commoditized by mm -hmm. the world around you. Mm -hmm. So when you are talking to people or when you're giving people things, you are, you are spending your time and we all have a limited amount of time on this earth. And so the idea is if I am, if I am living my life in a way 
that does not accord with what I enjoy, with what I value, with what I find is important, that is not fulfilling, then I am wasting all of my time. I'm wasting the gift of life that was given to me. Mm -hmm. And so some philosophers will come along and say, well, life isn't necessarily a gift, right? Life is a lot of suffering. So maybe, you know, things all suck, right? And, and those people you don't invite to your parties. <laughs> other, other philosophers would come along and say that, yeah. well, you should try to maximize your happiness and pleasure, or like kind of the hedonistic viewpoint. Yeah. yeah. But the existentialists kind of come along and say, well, you should only do those things if you, if you think they're valuable, if you think they're important. But what you think is important is so is the most important thing. That's really what you need to understand. And that's where this idea of sort of an authentic lifestyle comes comes into play. So, you know, existentialism generally believes that there's like no. It's a reaction to in very many ways, like kind of Marxist philosophy. It's a reaction to this idea that, you know, pre predominantly throughout the Western world's history, mm -hmm. we have thought that. You should live in a way that's ethical because you will get a reward in the afterlife. So if Jeez. you are good mm -hmm. on earth, yep, you're gonna you're gonna go that. to heaven. Yep. Or you're gonna be you're gonna be yep. right, you you will be given something to for doing this. What the existentialists will say is, and not all of them, right? Kierkegaard was religious and, and thought that actually having faith, but faith based on not that reward, but faith based on just faith itself. Mm -hmm. They believe that, well, you should not be living within constraints because one day you hope that you'll get to live without the constraints. Live how you fucking want. Right. Right. Do right. what you want now. Right. right. And right. so authenticity then to these people often meant, or to, again, to these people, authenticity to this kind of brand of thinking generally means, and again, it varies from person to person, everything else, from philosopher to philosopher, but generally what it means is you live in a way which is consistent to the values that you yourself think are important. Right, and that's where marketing steps in. <laughs> well, what's, what's interesting is, what's interesting is that a lot of the times, part of that authentic viewpoint would be mm -hmm. that you should not have values that are developed by the effect of other people. That's yes. why, like in in yeah. in kind of literature and everything else, if you read about you know mm -hmm. the existential hero or this concept of the existential hero, it often is this: it's a person just doing shitty things. You know, every existential philosopher yeah. wanted to be Napoleon. Essentially, they just wanted to do whatever the fuck they wanted. Right. You take whatever right, they wanted, everything right, else. Right. Right. Well, but, and it's also go ahead. Sorry. No. But so this concept of like authenticity was related yeah. to if I want to kill people, I'm going to kill people. If I want to hoard all of the money I can, I'm going to hoard all the money I can. If I want to live in the woods on my own without society around me, that's what I'm going to fucking do. It, right. None of it. There's no moral imperative to any of it. It doesn't matter right. what you do. But right. so long as you're doing it for the reasons that you yourself think are important, then it's fine. And but that's where it gets into qu right. the questions, though, because some other philosophers. Right. So people like um, people like from or others would come along and say, well, actually. Mm -hmm. You even if you live in accord with these other morals, so long as you think that they're important, like if you think it's important that you shouldn't have sex before marriage, even if you've been affected by other people in having that thought. Who cares if you think that it's important, you think it's important. So just do it. We are so far yeah. away from, from yeah, advertising. No, I think, <laughs> no, no, no. I, don't th I, I honestly don't think we are. I honestly don't think you are. I think, I think how, uh, how this gets translated into, into advertising is, um, and sort of into sort of brand and how that becomes adaptable is first of all, like all of the, all of that idea of like, what is authenticity and how do you define authenticity through, you know, uh, philosophy or whatever also has sort of this, um, this t effect over time, right? One generation's 
authentic self is going to be very different from another generation. Another 10 years, you're going to have a slightly different thought on what is authenticity, right? Because I think one of the things that marketing and brands have done is they have, they will co-opt and create as quickly as, if not faster, these, these sort of big philosophical ideas come into play, right? Because they're being driven by economics, right? If I want to make money um, and I am looking at a target audience that does not want to be marketed to in a conscious way, I have to figure out very quickly how to co-opt that. And I think that the authentic self is like one of the tools that they came up with to be able to do that in a more succinct fashion. I think it's harder because then you have to say, okay, well, it's almost like the non-brand brand, right? It's like, I cannot, um, I cannot prescribe a intent to this product, right? It has to, I, I have to end up listening to people around to see what they are saying or see what they are feeling or see what they feel is important and use that to market, right? Before it was more like a forward prescription, like I can get you to feel this way about Coca-Cola through a Christmas ad, right? That's forward. Now it's almost like this reactive thing. Like I have to go find these little nuggets, these little bits of truth that I would consider authentic out there in the market and then use that because then you are doing my marketing for me. You've created the brand already. I just have to latch onto it. And I think my favorite example of this is the idea of the teenager. Even though it happened in the 1940s, it's sort of the most early, um, I think what is the most early clear examples of this idea of the authentic self. And so, you know, I, when I, when I, before I learned about it, you know, I, I assumed one that the, the idea of the teenager was, um, you know, just kind of ever present, right? Like you go through this, you know, rebel without a cause kind of thing. There's the, the teenage rebellion. There's the, you know, there's always all these good stories about coming of age um, and the teenager, uh, you know, or this, this, this young person, like you said, like, um, like kind of like a, uh, the hero's journey, right? I mean, it fits in this really great archetype. You're you're challenging everything that you knew um, as you learn new things, and you're forging a path for yourself that's different from your family and different mm -hmm. from your parents, right? And so there's this this idea of this teenage rebellion, right? And there's a teenager. But um, what I learned is the teenager was a marketing ploy that basically happened in the 1940s and marketing, uh, I can't remember the guy's name off the top of my head, but was basically like, hey, you know, if we're going to sell more to, we've got all these things that we think kids want to buy. We have to create this market or better define this market and give them a reason to do it. So they created the idea of the teenager. And again, like teenage and rebellion go hand in hand. So the idea of, of, of rebellion becomes a uh, identity, a marketing ploy, right? That should be, it should be very authentic. Like if you think about the idea of rebellion, you think about, you know, again, like Arab Spring, you think about women's rights, you think about Black Lives Matter, you think about something that is, that is disruptive organically as a result of oppression. However, it is also a marketing ploy. If I can, you know, use that to sell you something without you knowing it, it becomes that much easier. If I can identify that, that, that disenfranchised audience that feels alienated and get them and, and listen to them and find out what they want, I can sell it to them without them knowing. And I think that that to me is sort of this insidiousness about the authenticity because there's just in marketing, I would argue that there is no such thing as authentic. There's only kind of this reaction and um, manipulation of so, the idea. Well, so what's interesting is a lot of, like, for example, we talked about mm -hmm. how Adorno and Horkheimer had this sort of, they kind of came down to the same, the same answer you did, sort of, which is that they're, they're, you can't be authentic. Well, what they basically came up with was you can't be authentic in a capitalist society. And that's kind of what Marx mm -hmm. thought too, right? It's part of the idea of like a socialist 
because utopia would be that everyone could be authentic because you would be out of this sort of feedback loop of of marketing and having your time co-opted to be sold back to you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the idea would the idea like Horkheimer and Adorno got into a lot of trouble because they were basically against like the hippies. They said, like, you know, um, the hippie culture is just capitalism reasserting itself. Um, yeah. Right. It's so totally that, true. Exactly. That's like that is. was the idea. Yeah. And that's totally true. Right. It's completely, completely, completely true today. Um, well, it's, I think it's true for every generation. Like, I think every generation where you think you have some idea of authentic rebellion, part of that is true. But along with it comes the advertising. Well, so, yes. Yeah, so, so, so what they what they talked about was this concept of the culture industry. Mm -hmm. And so what a culture industry really is, is it's this idea that. Um, it's a it's a specific type of late stage capitalism where essentially every type of culture has become part of the capitalist world. And so it's become a system now that doesn't just have very like capitalism when when like Marx talked about capitalism or whatever, talked about how the capitalist system has sort of a structure that develops around it. So like the idea, the basic idea of, of capitalism was or is you, I sell you something and you give me, you give me something in return, mm -hmm. right? When it becomes capitalism is when the thing you're trading becomes an abstraction of value. So it becomes money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this idea of like $1, if I do a job that it costs, if I do a job that I earn $1 an hour, then my trading a dollar for something is me trading an hour of my life for it. Mm -hmm. And so as that abstraction gets farther and farther apart, though, um, it stops becoming clear that what I'm trading is my labor. And so we end up in a system where there are all these other kind of structures around my labor and the trade that I'm doing for it that exist to help continue the system as it exists. So I'm kind of doing a bad job of explaining it, but the essential idea is like, like, OK, I trade you money now to purchase goods from you. That requires money to be made. It requires industries to exist to trade the money. It, ex mm -hmm. it requires an economy itself to decide the value of money because money, one hour of my money is going to be different depending on what my hour is, right? If I'm a doctor, then one hour of what I do is maybe more valuable um, or more in demand, I should say, not necessarily more valuable right. than maybe an hour of like a farmer, right? Because a lot of people can farm, but not a lot of people can be doctors. Let's just take that assumption, whatever, right? Well, and then also a lot of people can, you know, it, it would go into, you know, other demographics like an hour of, of a white man's time is is going to be paid more than a black woman. Right. So. Yeah. Right. And so then basically what happens is that culture comes about to explain mm -hmm. why there are these sorts of disparities. Yeah. So why is it that a doctor gets paid more than a farmer? Because the doctor is doing something harder. But not harder in like a physical way, right? Farming is clearly harder than being a doctor in terms of physicality. But so we start we start to not value physicality as much as maybe mental labor or skill, right? Like dexterity becomes more important than skill. Or like Marie said, whiteness in itself becomes more valuable, viewed as more valuable. So things Currency. like, you know, yep. um, white fashion or white music or white literature or whatever becomes more valued mm -hmm. than other types of those uh you know, commodities. So, or they co-opt the other cultures and make it and white. turn it white, right? So, anyways, yeah. it's this whole this whole big crazy kind of thing. Whatever. Just trying to explain the thinking here, but to, to behind this, you might not agree with it, but this is sort of how this thinking developed over time. What Adorno and Horkheimer said was that, besides those economic systems existing, what eventually capitalism does is it creates cultural systems that also help to kind of prop up the system of you know, imbalance that exists where some people are getting money for doing nothing, right? Literally, you're just getting money mm -hmm. for having money. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. other people are, are getting money for working. 
that's a big imbalance there if you think about money as your time, right? Yeah, but Chris, just to jump in, I have a question. I mean, yes, I, I would think about marketing and brand with capitalism, but I mean, really with communism, brand is pretty, it's pretty important too, right? I mean, even though it doesn't necessarily affect the outward, uh, you know, the economic model, it's still hugely prevalent well it's that's that's the whole right. that's the whole like even the even the idea of like communism or socialism itself mm -hmm. is just a brand it's just marketing right because yeah. you know in in the viewpoint of like you know all, mm -hmm. all of these philosophers thought that not all of them but let's say like like marx and, and ah, whoever all of them just say all they of them. thought mm -hmm. that they had no real solid definition basically they thought that like the socialist paradise would just be your time is no longer being given away for stuff. You could yeah. spend your time as you wanted to. Huh. Nope. Which it's like what? Like so they they always they always thought that there was like a technological requirement for this to happen, right? We would have robots or machines mm -hmm. that could do mm -hmm. all of the labor for us to produce the stuff we oh, needed man, to live. Oh man, those robots are going to sell us stuff. Clearly. Well, Facebook. so, but that's, that's the, that's the thing, you know? So even like this idea of like what you listener likely think about communism or socialism, and even what we think Marie and I think about socialism or communism or capitalism, those are essentially like cultural brands that have developed. Yes. So, and that's actually really what Adorno and Horkheimer kind of said was that in a society like the one we're in now, Every cultural thing, punk rock music, um, hmm. motorcycles, you know, communism, whatever, all of it becomes branded and sold back to us in some way. Yep. And so it is inescapable. You cannot escape this cap. You cannot escape the capitalist system because it's become so effective. I don't think they would use the word effective necessarily, but it's become it's so... Effective. It's become yeah. so ingrained in our society that there's just no way really mm -hmm. to kind of break free of it. So and that's and it's actually, I think, part of like Marie in the beginning, mm -hmm. you gave a really interesting you said something really interesting that I didn't talk about at first in the first episode, which was this idea that. Marketing exists to help your brand or your product make as much money as possible. To me, that in itself mm -hmm. is inauthentic. You do not mm -hmm. need more money than you can ever use. Eh, well, well, I think, so I don't think it's so much, it's money, but it's market share. It's mind. It's, 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 but you don't need to it, control all of the market share. But well, I think what you do, you do. That's the goal. Like, I think the goal to me, it's almost like a virus, right? Like if I have a brand and I'm just going to use Starbucks just because I'm going to use Starbucks, right? Um, because it's a big brand or think of any big brand. Think of Apple. Think of Apple's a good one and Apple's used ad nauseum. So I'm just going to pick on Apple. You have a brand that is, that dominates, dominates the market, right? It is making money hand over fist. But the thing that it, the thing the brand wants more is market share. It doesn't want competition. It doesn't want disruption. It wants total dominance. And if it can, part of that dominance I look at as not just your money, because your money is like, your money is sort of a byproduct. Like if I can get, if I'm a brand, I'm Apple. If I can get that person, I've got their money. I've got their money for life. I've got their brand loyalty and they're going to do whatever I want. So you really are kind of wanting the psychological hold or this mental space in that person that is this affinity for what you are, what Apple is. See, but okay, but think about it in this think about it in this opposite mm -hmm. way then. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is Again, it's sort of one of those questions of like, it's almost like nuclear disarmament. Because if if mm -hmm. if I'm a small company competing against like Apple, mm -hmm. they have the nuclear weapons. I mm -hmm. would be an idiot to say that I'm not going to use them. 
right? If, well, if yeah, Apple is using use marketing, Apple uses them. if yeah. Apple is using marketing, I'm a moron to say I'm not going to use marketing then because I can't, I just will not well, ever be able to be successful in doing that. But you do have to like get to an economy of like, you have to like, again, like I think Apple is dominant because of, and keeps like smaller emerging brands out because they employ. Um, so the, okay. I, yeah, ahead, no, that's, no, no, it's another, it's another, by. it's another important point, but I guess what mm -hmm. I'm wondering is, mm -hmm. can you beat can, Apple? Well, like can a, one of the things that, one of the things, I think one of the myths that exist about the digital economy today or the internet today is that small, small co companies, small groups mm -hmm. of people can, by producing good enough content or good enough items, good enough, good enough value mm -hmm. can overcome the big companies. I don't think they can. Which I think is total bullshit. Yeah, I, I think yeah. it's I think it's a myth. I think that is a think pipe it's a dream. It's a myth. It's a pipe it's a myth. dream. Well, they certainly there's there's a lot out there that has been perfected by companies like Apple to keep that from happening. Because the other thing is like again, you only have this short attention span. So how am I as a small company going to disrupt something that is in, as embedded as Apple to get that attention span? Yeah. And that's and I and, just don't think you like if you do it, if it happens, it can be like um like that gun example that we used for the gun coffee example that we used in our fir the, in the first episode of the series. Like, you know, it can have inconsequential effects that you didn't see happening. Right. Like it, it's it, going to ruin you. Exactly. <laughs> you like know? it can happen. It can totally happen. But then it becomes something that you didn't expect to begin with. Right. You right. know, and that no, and I think yeah. but I think that and that also gets into like this idea of authenticity. Yeah. Like because mm -hmm. think about it like with music. Well, mm -hmm. I think one of the most interesting examples of this is with music where a band is considered authentic until they become successful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then they are mm -hmm. sellouts, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, or yeah, even a podcast, band always even podcast that yeah. happens with podcasts, yeah. too. Yeah. Like yeah. podcasts are considered authentic and like raw and great and whatever until the podcaster or the streamer or whoever starts making money and becoming successful I, at it. I can hardly wait to sell out. I mean, I cannot wait. Give me the money, but it, it becomes, it's a very interesting problem. It's a very interesting conundrum because mm -hmm. people expect you to, I think again, it's part of this. It's a part of an interesting dichotomy there where, you know, so long as you continue to be authentic to the values that you set out for yourself, I don't mm -hmm. think success has to be a limiting. I don't think success has to be kind of like a, a off and on switch for authenticity. No, I agree. But I also think, you know, you brought up music and like the band is witty, gritty, grind, but, and then it's like, and then they hit it big and it's, it's considered um, cliche. But I mean, a lot of that is sort of a uh, fabrication as well. One of the examples you know, that I was reading about from a series um, from a series from Frontline called Cool Hunting uh, or the Merchants of Cool looked at Limp Biscuit, the band, right, which I personally hate, but they were hugely successful and they were completely manufactured. Yeah. They were completely there's no origin story with them that was like um, that they had a gritty, you know, garage. No, it's, it's startup. The anti the anti boy band. The anti-boy band, right? So they are, and, and every boy band has had, had that sort of, but they were the anti-boy band and they were a carefully marketed strategy, like just like the Sex Pistols, one of the the, the, the leaders, you know, the when you think about punk rock, one of the top five things, top three, not top one for music is Sex Pistols. They were completely manufactured. Yeah. All of that was manufactured. All by, that was by, manufactured. By, by, by an advertising fucking genius who owned a sex yes. shop. Exactly. Yes, 100%. Exactly. And I think that to me is like, okay, well, does that make, but here's the question then, does that make the Sex Pistols less authentic or less important? No. However, I do think it just shows that basically that mechanism or that uh, that brand identity or that that marketing, it is, it is cultural. It's not something that is ever going to be mm -hmm. successfully separated from, uh, from culture. 
It's part of it. You know, yeah, hundred uh, percent. You know, we. I think the, the well, the funniest thing about all of this, though. Ah! So no. all of this, like all mm-hmm. of this thinking, all of this thought process, all of this kind of mm-hmm. you know concern and whatever about this, and the science shows that marketing doesn't even really work that well. And that's what we're going to talk about when we come back from this break. So this this is from an article in in Forbes from mm-hmm. 2020 yeah. by Jason Fishman. Um, and so he basically said that the, the article starts off this way. It's kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. Tell everyone, you know, it's true. Marketing does not work. It was John Wanamaker, the department store magnet, who once said, half the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The trouble is, I don't know which half. (laughs) That's good. The preconceived notion that running a marketing campaign will produce a positive response from a target audience is false by definition. To begin, if you consider that the average click-through rate of a digital ad, a consistent delivery method, is 1%, and a successful conversion rate is about 2% in many circumstances, the majority of any demographic does not perform. This 0.02% effectiveness level, or 1 in 5,000 person closing rate, would be looked at as virtually non-existent in any other conversation. Think about it. Would you buy anything or employ anyone that only worked 0.02% of the time? The best marketing campaigns are only working at a microscopic level, if any. That, to me, is super interesting. Yes. What? Yes. So because at the beginning of this, we kind of talked mm-hmm. about how does advertising really work? And there was this kind of science that showed maybe it doesn't really work. Right. And mm-hmm. there are a bunch of articles out there like this. You know, there was another one here that I found, which was uh, from the University of Pennsylvania. This is from 2021, from July, actually. And so they actually published an article that said or showed that essentially. Um, so this was published in Nature. It was mm-hmm. called. um This one here was called Topological Measures for Identifying and Predicting the Spread of Complex Contagions. And so what they actually meant here by contagions was social media, like viral marketing. Yes. It was how how does that actually work? And so what they actually found was that a lot of the times when we think about like viral marketing, you think, and, and this is true in podcasting too, you think that like, if I just get one famous podcaster to retweet us, we're going to be golden. Right. You know, we're we're, we're going to have it made. Nah. No. That actually no. d- never works, right? No. When what they actually found was that getting people to, like influencers, getting influencers to try to sell your brand doesn't mm-hmm. work because most people don't like influencers. It's, if anything... Well, they're you're, already you're, passe, if, right? Well, they're if already, anything... Well, it's not yeah. even necessarily passe. It's like, if anything, your brand might be helping the influencer's image more than vice versa. Well, I think what I mean by passe is like we have already identified like the mass audience, the target audience has already identified that the influencer is now trying to sell us something. Right. So right. it is less authentic. And OK, less, got it. Yeah, it's, it's less, already failed. We're less receptive. Got it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And so what they actually found was that instead of going for like influencers, what you need to do mm-hmm. is try to build. Build influence with people on the edge. So people that are like just becoming influencers, mm-hmm. people who are mm-hmm. people who are influencers, but not in the way that they're famous or whatever, but more that they just have like a large demographic spread. Yeah. So mm-hmm. if you, you know, forget like the, the the example they give is like Kim Kardashian. They say, like, if you get Kim Kardashian to drink your coffee, that is not going to affect your sales at all, likely. You might see some effect, but it's not going to be long lasting. It's not going to really be the right. kind of effect you want. Right. It's a hundred times more successful to get mm-hmm. kind of proto Kim Kardashians. So like you get a Instagram model with 5,000 followers to show that they like your mm-hmm. coffee. And if she's also involved in like, you know, Black Lives Matter and social justice mm-hmm. stuff and environmental stuff and whatever, then that's even better because it hits a whole bunch mm-hmm. of other things and signifies that your brand is for all of those other good things. Well, you bring up kind of an interesting point, which I think I don't know if we've touched on. And you're basically you're saying so like with 
you know, again, what they were saying with um, click through rates or uh, direct response, right? You have this 0.5 or 0.05 response rate. And how does that pay out? The thing that it, you have to maintain is not just the acquisition, right? So I've got that. I have just convert I mailed I or I I had millions and millions and millions of click throughs and I only got like a handful of people that responded so I've acquired them but what are they how much money can I get for them to spend over the course of their life on my product mm -hmm. which is the long time conversion right which is really what you're trying to do with a brand my brand isn't something that you can just dip in and out of right like you were saying with Subaru your, your early example Last episode with Subaru, like you buy Subaru because it's quality, but Subaru is also marketing quality to you. So there's this sort of loop, right? So how, how I can't just, I, I got to get you to buy one. I got to get you to buy your next one. And then I got to get your kids to want to buy it, right? So it's sort of the longevity of that life and the dedication to that brand is what makes that 0.05 um, worth it, right? That's mm -hmm. the revenue. So I think that that's sort of like, I'm, I'm curious how that kind of affects, mm. like, again, like it, it kind of echoes what you're saying with the, the fringe, the fringe neo um, influencers, right? The, the, the just becoming, or the anti-influencers, right? They're like, they're the, uh, on the edge and they, they have all of these other touch points that affect all of these other things that should, that if you are able to get into that you have a sort of this pipeline. You have this life you know, of the it, product. It creates a really interesting, your point there is super interesting because it, like you're saying, it's not necessarily the individual conversions that maybe matter. It's nope. more the... Keeping them. Yeah, like if, if every one of those conversions mm -hmm. creates an edge influencer. Right, right. Then right. that is really valuable. Maybe. Right. Because that's that is again, that's the brand loyalty. Right. Yeah. If I can. Hmm. And the, God for, you know, I'm going to talk about this stuff because but it's and it is already dated, but like the net influencer. Right. You're the net. You've heard about this. Like there's people out there that love the brand so much that they advocate. They become what's the word I'm thinking of? It's yeah. Like, yeah. Like a champion. Accolade. Or, yeah. They're an accolade or a um, uh, whatever. I mean, they will they will advocate for the brand talk about the brand and do marketing's work for them. They love it mm. so much. And that is what you're trying to get to. You're trying to get to that level. You're not always going to get to that level, but when you get to that level, that person, one, it, you've got them, hope you, you've got them for life and they will work for you and spend money for you and sort of have this almost like trickle down on every other place that they touch. Which is, again, insidious. It's like a virus. I don't have to get everyone sick, right? I don't have to get everyone sick. I just have to get a couple people sick. And I have to get, maybe out of those couple people, I have to get, like, two people very sick. God. Then I've got it. What? Yeah, it's true. It's, it's how it works. <laughs> it's such, you know. It's insidious, but it's true. Because you're like, well, 0.5, that's nothing. Yeah, well, it's nothing. No, that's true. But if you think about how often, how often, there you're getting hit, right? So it's not just you're 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 doing this every day, day in, day out, like hundreds of times a day, you're kind of going through that click-through rate on some level. All they have to do is get you one of those times, and for one of those times in the course of your life, all you have to do is kind of become dedicated to something, yeah. to one brand. And if they got that, then I mean think about like think just I mean Re, re step back and look at your dedication to Subaru. I mean, if you looked at the stats, maybe the stats would say, like an objective stats would say, well, Subaru is actually break down on average as much as any other car. And sometimes maybe, maybe they don't even last as long. I'm making that up, right? But it's sort of like that's, you're kind of now into this feedback loop where that notion doesn't come into your mind as much because you're like, I buy it because it's quality. I buy mm -hmm. it because it's mm -hmm. quality. Mm -hmm. But like, how sure are you that that is an objective thing? Or how much has that advertising and that brand already kind of entered your blood system? You know, gotcha. well, it, it also, I think, 
Not that you shouldn't love your Subaru, because it is probably a good car. No, well, I'm just but, saying, no, it's but objectively, I totally it's saying. very hard to tell. It makes, yeah. it, you know, one of the other things, one of the big questions this series has made me consider, and like the reading Uh-oh. and everything else is, is there... Why aren't we in the woods? In <laughs> well, a, besides in a that, hunt. besides why are we not no, in the woods joking. right now? There's uh-huh. also, you know, in a lot of these studies we read, the thing that they kept seeming to show was advertising is effective up to a point and then it starts to hurt your company or it starts to hurt your brand. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I honestly wonder, like, I don't know the last time I saw a commercial for Mountain Dew. I, like, I can't think of the last time I saw a commercial for Mountain Dew. And I, I don't really drink Mountain Dew. Mountain Dew. Now I want Mountain Dew. No, I want one. No, sorry. Well, well, well I was going to say, <laughs> like, like, like mm-hmm. I don't know the last time I saw a commercial for uh, hot dogs, really. Mm-hmm. Right? Like, I don't know the last time I saw a commercial for hot dogs, but I fucking love hot dogs. Right? I, I'm, I'm going to go. Mm-hmm. I'm going to have hot dogs this week now because I thought about mm-hmm. eating hot dogs now. I don't like I wonder at this point. Could these brands stop advertising? Like, what would it do if they just stopped? Well, it's impossible. It's sort of impossible to tell, I think, in some ways. Because, I mean, some brands, there are brands that just die. Like, think about Blockbuster. Blockbuster. Yeah, but that, but that died because. Juggernaut. That died because they had a shitty business model now, right? Like it well, they had a shitty business model, but they could have, they could have, um, they could have outpaced Netflix. They could have, they could have done it, and it, but it didn't. It didn't work. And they well, had they a shitty business they, model. They, they refused but to that buy brand Netflix. Died. Well, that brand died. I mean, in effect, that brand died. And but in some ways, it's it's in its death. It's e- even more interesting with like the last blockbuster, right? The mythos now of the last blockbuster somewhere in Alaska yeah, or whatever that is. I don't think blockbuster is a good example though. Because well, I think okay. So Blockbuster, some other brand Blockbuster is dead. died. Like Blockbuster stopped producing content. Yeah. They, um, they well, they they were a dinosaur. They didn't move quick enough. Yeah. No, I'll give you that. I'm just saying, sort of think of it. It's hard to think of a brand that's dead because it's dead, right? Because it's left. It's it's left. You you can name Mountain Dew by name, and I I bet you can if you are thinking about it. I bet you can see the the logo. Oh, absolutely. But I guess right. I guess what I'm wondering is. So it's already in the bloodstream. Maybe what? not dead. Yeah. Yeah. But that, mm-hmm. see, but that's what I'm saying, though. Right. At a mm-hmm. certain point, if we're going to go with this analogy of a virus. Right. Mm-hmm. At a certain mm-hmm. point. The virus has already sort of gotten out there in the environment. Yeah. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I'm drinking like I get Mountain Dew when I get Mountain Dew, which it has. I had, honestly, Mountain Dew is a shitty example because I don't drink Mountain Dew. But like. I get Mountain Dew when I've gotten Mountain Dew because I want to be like, I like the taste. I want it to be energetic and whatever. And I feel like, you know, throwing up later. Right. But um, like Coca, I guess Coca-Cola maybe is a better example. Yeah. I, I drink Coca-Cola or Pepsi occasionally um, because I want a Coca-Cola or a Pepsi. Like I like the flavor of it. I want to have that flavor. Um, and it's, you know, and whatever. Right. I'm right. sure there are other psychological things that are like, oh, it's a treat and it reminds you of being a kid and like all that other kind of stuff that's out there around it. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying, though, is I wonder, like, could they stop advertising? Could they stop advertising for like got their hooks 50 years? Yeah. Well, or could, could or could they do could they advertise in a totally different way? Right. So now, like, like, OK, like, mm-hmm. uh, you know, Coca-Cola stops putting normal ads on TV, mm-hmm. but instead they just sponsor stuff. Yeah. So, you know, mm-hmm. this ball game mm-hmm. is sponsored by Coca-Cola, mm-hmm. right? Or, you know, mm-hmm. from, mm-hmm. um, from infinite jest, which does is, is on its own, its own, like dude to read infinite jest is like its own marketing demographic of like douchebags. But, um, <laughs> in that book, he, he, he has this, it. he has that joke of like, you know, the year of the adult, the year of the depends adult undergarment, right? So advertisers right. have started, right. brands have started yeah. advertising by owning yeah. years. Um, I really do wonder that's pretty much on, you know, or even like in video games now, Mm -hmm. their video games like racing games will put billboards of actual products in their games. Yep. That's that's smart. That's smart. So I think I think it can migrate to that. I don't think those brands will ever stop marketing completely. Like, I think that the nature of 
how you're being marketed to and how brands interact with consumers is naturally migrating to other platforms and to other kind of instances. But the problem with stopping marketing, because you would think that, like, I'm going to want a Diet Coke, whether I see a Diet Coke or whatever, right? I'm going to want one. But again, I think it goes back to market share and kind of that market share dominance and permanency. Like, you never want to put yourself so far out on a limb that you could have some competitor yeah, but you hypothetically could, see, come in and take it away. But that's what I'm saying, though, right? Like, you could mm -hmm. do that. Coca, I'm not ordering a Coke versus a Pepsi at a restaurant because I have a preference for one over the other. I'm asking them for a Coke and they're saying, we have Pepsi, is that okay? And I say, yeah, that's fine. Seriously? You, wait, hold up, hold up here. You don't have a preference between the two. For real. I mean, I okay, I have a preference for the flavor of one versus the other, but what I'm saying is that if hmm. I, I'm getting what is available mm -hmm. to me, right? If my supermarket stopped having pepsi and only only had coke i'd buy coke probably do you know what i'm saying like yeah that's that's what i'm saying it seems that's a to weird me, example because pepsi's disgusting it's okay <laughs> it seems to me more Sorry. it seems Ugh. to me more than <laughs> what matters is brand to brand marketing and and business stuff today than it is to advertise <laughs> to people like i always get really i always wonder they do those commercials for like medicine on TV. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mm -hmm. who the, f who, who is going to their doctor and being like, I want this medicine. Like you go People to the do. doctor. Actually, I do think that that's, I think that that's actually kind of effective. But we should research see, that. That's crazy though, because I go to the doctor and, I, and Wait, the, if the doctor is like, well, we have, if the, if you go to the doctor and you're like, look, I have eczema, I need a treatment. And the doctor's like, oh, I'll give you this. I don't think you would be like, I can't imagine a world where I would be like, I prefer, I prefer, you know, whatever, Exagon by from GlaxoSmithKline, oh, yeah. right? And it, you would actually you take challenge what is that, yeah. offered to you, right? You take what's offered to you. Well, I mean, but that again, that's almost also, I think, so you're getting into sort of the illusion of choice in some ways with marketing, but like, like, I don't know. I think that marketing in general is, it is always based at the consumer. Like it's always based at the individual consumer or the demographic of that consumer. But I think the way that it's starting to get to, to make that, to get into that bloodstream is, is different than TV. Cause I mean, right now I don't watch commercials, right? I, you know, no, I, me, me neither. Right that's, through it. that's what I'm I saying. Stream. So exactly. Right? So, so I don't, so, but that, that in itself is, again, that's the dinosaur. The commercial's dead, right? The commercial's dead. So we have to find some other way that we're going to be able to get in front of people. What does that look like? How do See, we do that? I actually wonder, and this is, this is, I guess what I'm wondering is, mm. I wonder that if brands, instead of focusing on advertising, mm -hmm. like when I am given the option I, I I watch a lot of we watch a lot of streaming TV in this house, as you can imagine, because mm -hmm. we're like, you know, mm -hmm. filthy millennials. Mm -hmm. And when I go to watch a show and it says you can watch this ad free if you just watch one ad from whoever. Mm -hmm. That to me is much more effective marketing. Than showing me an ad, you know, with uh, whoever right over and over again. Yeah, well, I think, but that's like, again, that's like a testing, right? Like that's an A-B test. Would you do this or would you do that? Right. right? So but it's so, almost like a, vari a variability of what the... Well, but so that's what I guess I'm kind of getting at is mm -hmm. I wonder with advertising, if brands moving towards we, we're going out of our way to not bother you. That to me seems like the next big thing in advertising. I don't know. I'm not an but, advertising or marketing person or genius or whatever. But they still got to bother you. that stuff. Right? They still got to well, bother you. They, they just, at least, you well, can't look, know they, that you're being bothered. That's no, they have, they have to step in and be like, look, we're, we're actively not bothering you. But if right. that's two seconds long, that right. to me is much more effective than, right. you know, 18 well, hours think, of advertising. But again, I think, I, I think it almost goes back to the idea of the brand and, and being able to influence mm. you without you consciously knowing you're being influenced right because if you're just watching one thing you're like i'm cool with that and just like you said i want brands just to step back and be like oh we're not going to bother you but the whole notion of sales is they're 
they've got to get you, right? Mm-hmm. They've got to mm-hmm. sell you. So how are they, how are they selling you without you know you knowing you're being sold to? And that's I think what's coming Marie. up like with with this. Yeah, it's a fascinating world. <sighs> Man, what I want a Mountain Dew. What a dystopian hellscape we live in. Dear listeners, as long as it's got Mountain Dew and no Pepsi, I'm okay. I'm okay I, I'm with honestly, that hellscape, I baby. Am perplexed at your anti-Pepsi stance. I feel like they. I am. I am shocked. I am shocked at your pro-Pepsi agenda. I'm not pro-Pepsi. Uh, I'm neutral. I'm uh, neutral, yo. How, My, how, yo. And that's even worse. Like, have you tasted? Like, and again, this goes back to Pepsi versus Coke. This is advertising, right? But. Like there is a huge difference. They taste off like one taste. Pepsi tastes really awful. I oh guess I haven't. I guess I haven't had Fox. a Pepsi since like being a teenager. <laughs> so maybe We've they gotta do. Like, I got to get I got to pry that Dunkin Donuts out of your hand and get a get a cold, a cold diet Coke in there. You know, what's also really good is um diet Dr. Pepper. God forbid. I love diet Dr. Pepper. Interesting. See, I'm, I am just a, I am just a cog. A cog in the giant wheel. Oh, so am I. Are you kidding me? Oh. Marie, my life literally runs on Duncan. I can't get enough. All right. Oh, my God. Dear listeners, before we start just selling ourselves for advertising money, um, although Which listen to will. the ads. Um, <laughs> we we love you advertisers. all. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Mad Scientist Podcast. We'll be back next week. Thank you again, dear listeners, for listening to the Mad Scientist Podcast. I have been your host, Chris Cogswell, joined by my co-host. Marie Mayhew. If you'd like to contact the show, please send us an email at themadscientistpodcast at gmail.com. That's all one word. You can also follow us on Twitter at madscientistpod or at Team Giant Squid for Marie. And of course, you can see us on Facebook, on Instagram, and all over the internet as the Mad Scientist Podcast. And again, our logo is the one with the pumpkin head, so it's easy to see. Mm-hmm. If you've enjoyed the show tonight, please consider supporting us on Patreon where the money that you give to us will help us to promote this show further, to make it better, and just to spend more time making it. Because we love doing that. We do love doing that. Our logo was designed by Carrie Shaheen. Our web design is done by Desdemona Howard. And our sound design is done by Jake Cardinal. 